You're listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum focused and dedicated 100% to sales development. If you care about growing your skills and getting more new sales appointments, pipeline, and closed one deals, you came to the right place. Subscribe to the show on YouTube, iTunes, or Spreaker, and be sure to go back and listen to all the episodes for the best strategies, tips, and tactics out there on running a high-performance sales development program. And now, your host, founder, and CEO of TenBound at TenBound.com, David Delaney. CRM has been proven to limit sales reps' responsiveness, persistency, and cadence. It's a design flaw, and it's losing you deals. That is why today's sales leaders use sales engagement platforms like VanillaSoft. Check it out. Go to VanillaSoft.com and start your free trial. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I am super excited to introduce the next guest. He has been on John Barrow's podcast. He's been on Predictable Revenue. And I am just super grateful to get you on the Sales Development Podcast. Mr. Christopher Fago, the cloud, (laughs) you just told it to me, you, you just changed. So this is messing me up. So the cloud security inside sales manager now at Palo Alto Networks. How are you doing today, Christopher? Doing good. How are you doing, David? Oh man, I, I gotta I gotta learn that because for so long you were at Redlock, but you uh, just got acquired a few months ago. So now you're over at uh, Palo Alto. Yeah. So it's 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 been a month officially. This is the Wednesday of week four. So you know we're still in the the infancy where I'm counting the days. But it, you know we're, we're we're rounding about the end of the first month since the acquisition and and kind of just everyone's still getting acclimated and figuring out, you know, their, their, their attack strategy and where they play in the, uh, the organization, so to speak. It's really definitely an exciting time for all of us at Redlock to, to join a company like Palo Alto Networks. It is. I've been through a few of those and it's, it's tricky because you're trying to, you know, figure out where you fit in and how, how it's going to work, but it's also really exciting. And I am, I'm psyched to get you on the show because I'm looking at this. Like, if you guys haven't seen Christopher's LinkedIn page, you know, here's the credibility for getting on the show. Okay. Top performing sales development rep, Q4, Q2, 2018. Top performing sales development rep, Q1. Redlock rocker of the year sales development, which is freaking awesome. Top performing sales rep, sales development rep, 16, 17. I mean, dude, this is, it goes on. There's like six of these. And that's, you know, from your company, you know, giving you these awards, man. I mean, this is amazing. Now, we're, we're talking today about SDR shaming, right? And a lot of the stuff that we see and SDR as a career path. You know, let's talk about this. Like, I've seen a lot of stuff on LinkedIn about people get a bad message or, you know, the message isn't customized. And then they put it on there with the SDR's name and, and picture, you know, what are your thoughts about this trend that you see? So I, I think we're only seeing half the story, or at least I'd like to give these shamers the benefit of the doubt. You know, hopefully they are at least providing the courtesy call. If you get an error or, you know, as they're calling it, you know, basically, you know, it's a failure to personalize or pay attention or even just like make sure you all of your naming conventions, check out whatever you want to call it. If, if you get a message like that, I'm, I'm hoping that what we don't see is that they're reaching out and they're saying, hey, Chris, maybe take some time to slow down before you reach out. Just, you know, human to human, right? If sales is all about humanizing, if that's what, the, if that's the trend we're trying to get back to, which is humanizing sales, you know, our prospects need to be human too. And they cannot just, you know, get the social media train going and just bash these, you know, young sales professionals who sometimes one, they're not even control of what's getting sent out or even two, you may, you don't know what's going on in their life. They might be under extreme pressure to hit crazy metrics that don't necessarily align with the right metrics. Right. We see it in organizations all the time where there's, it's still a boiler room. Yeah. So, you know, exactly. I'm just hoping that there's another side of the coin that maybe we don't see where they reach out and they say, hey, you messed up. I hope you take this as a learning lesson. But then the other side of me thinks if they would be willing to do that, why would they also publicly shame them? So I'm not sure you get both, but I'd like to think we can have a world where those both exist. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think what happens is it's like, you know, the person gets the message and and there's more and more it actually happens through LinkedIn. There's a lot of there's a lot of spam that's coming through LinkedIn and the in-mail thing and there's more and more coming in so they just like they take a screenshot of it and they're just like, "God, you know, this person like sent me this really spammy message through LinkedIn. I'll take a screenshot of it. I'll post it on LinkedIn and be like, don't do this, you know? And so they, it's, it's two things. It's like, it's cathartic to, you know, show this, this person who violated like prospecting rules. And then it's also like trying to pretend to help other people by posting this and saying, don't do this, you know? And it's like, in the meantime, to your point, the person who sent the the spam, you know, or what's considered spam LinkedIn is is like being actually shamed, you know, because you usually see their name and their picture on there, and they might not even have anything to do with this this message that it's just like sent under their name, you know. Sure, and and even if they are, I mean, who among us hasn't made a, a miscue, whether it's in sales? or, you know, text messaging, right? Like technology is one of those wonderful things that if you have it, you think it's only going to make you better. So like a good example is like, I think David, if I had an iPhone when I was in high school, I would have been a better student. But the reality is I probably would have just gotten in more trouble because I would have had access to the technology that like gives you this, the internet, right? To shame people. So, or to be, you know, like cyber bully. I don't understand how people can be against cyberbullying, but okay with like SDR shaming or like salespeople shaming. They're one in the same. And so it's just one of those interesting things where you just don't know someone's situation. And yes, it's bad that they messed up. And maybe it's bad that they quote unquote spammed you by not putting your name in there. But do them the courtesy, you know, human to human and just say, hey, I don't know how many of these you sent out. Hopefully I was the only one. But if not, you know, maybe try to get ahead of it because this doesn't look so good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I I would say, you know, to your point, it's like try to go to them directly and in a private message and help them out a little bit and be like, this is, you know, I've gotten like three of these or this is this is, you know, you should try to improve versus I mean, basically what we're talking about is cyberbullying. It's cyberbullying of SDRs, right? A hundred percent. And that's where it's uh cyber shaming. Yeah. The, the cyber shaming of salespeople has got to stop because, you know, you know, there are highs and lows in sales and, you know, I've, I've heard it from pretty much everyone. So this isn't my quote, but, you know, being in sales, the, uh, the highs of the days in which I, I love my job definitely outweigh the days in which I hate my job, but like there are lows, right? So I know that I saw one today. I saw someone get shamed. I'm sure this this guy already got chewed out by his boss, and he already he he's already in a low point because like he didn't succeed in convincing someone to trade time with him, which was his goal. So he failed there. He failed because he was shamed. I'm, I know his boss is chewing him out. So ultimately, like that's a day that you know a young professional might not recover from. And it's not necessarily accurate to say that like sales isn't for them because they had a bad day. But I just put myself in their shoes and I think about how that would be. I would probably just go home. I'd be like, I'm going to take the rest. Of, I'm going to take the afternoon off because clearly I have no idea what I'm doing. Well, and that's okay. <laughs> okay. So I want to ask you too. I mean, some of these campaigns, you know, are out, actually out of the the control of the SDR. So it's coming from the manager actually who is sending these or the VP of sales, for example, like what if, if, if an SDR feels like they don't want to be, you know, involved in the campaign as far as having their name, like, what should they do? Can they go talk to the manager or, you know? What, yeah. Yeah. What I think, think so. I, I definitely think, okay, if, you know, if something is being sent on your behalf and you don't stand by it, I think you should at least try to have that conversation. Now, I'm not saying that you should die on that hill because it's a pretty petty hill to die on. You'll probably lose if you're too aggressive. But you, explaining to, to your, you know, I think there's, a, there's a, a time and a place, right? So one thing I always think about from sales development, inside sales, is that 
your first six months, you should be an observer, like a sponge. And then after the six month mark, that's where you open that notebook and you say, okay, here are all the crazy ideas I've wanted to tell you, but I, I was waiting until I had provided my value or proven my worth. And that's where I think, you know, you should trust your management if they're doing things on your behalf. It's obviously in their best interest for you to succeed. Otherwise, they're just wasting time and money on you, which is is un, is not what is the case, right? I think a lot of young professionals think if they get a bad patch or, or, or it always seems like there's this vibe that someone's out to get you when you're young and they're not. You know, a company's not going to recruit you and hire you just because they want you to like have a hard time and fail like they want you to succeed. So you should trust in your management if they're doing that stuff on your behalf. But there should come a time where you say, hey, I've got I've got these creative juices flowing and I would like to challenge you to do better than you. Nice. I think that's okay. a that's a good way to frame the conversation. Say, I understand these are this is our sequence and it look it's doing pretty good, but I think I can do better. Can I do an A B test? And if I win, you know, maybe I get like an extra day off or like a hundred dollar spiff or, or whatnot. And then we, you know, we slowly transition the rest of the team to whatever's working more successfully. Nice. And actually, that's a really good contest idea that I, I remember from a past life. We had, yeah. we had like an A B test contest and whoever got the highest, uh, you know, open rate or click rate got some kind of prize. So I love that. And, you know, you mentioned something earlier too is that, most people getting into sales development, you know, they 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 just look at it as like a quick stop, and you know, they want to do it for a while, you know, get all beat up and like <laughs> get shamed on LinkedIn, and then get the hell out of it. But you know, from a business perspective, it's it's better if they stick around and and they take their hard hard won learning and like stay in the pr- profession. So. You know, what would you, what do you say to people, you know, in, in the recruiting field or people getting into this about, you know, making it a, a short stop versus, you know, maybe even getting into it for a few years? Yeah. So I actually think the first time I heard anyone summarize this the correct way was at, at a conference and they said that you should sell the sales development role as a two year investment. So when you start thinking about investments, right, if you go meet with like a a financial advisor, what is he going to ask you? He's going to say like, you know, how aggressive do you want to be? Or like, what's your, like, when do you want to be able to be able to access the money? When you apply that sort of logic to a job, like a sales development job, it's like, okay, why don't you look at this as like a two, like this is a hold, like you're holding this investment. We want you in the company for at least two years so that you can understand the ins and outs. I mean, I personally believe that there's a lot of business acumen that's gained in kind of chunks through like trial by fire. So, you know, like I said, the first six months, maybe you're just a sponge, but then like you get to, you get a little bit more responsibility and, and kind of like breathing room and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And, and, you know, eventually it goes back to that old notion, like you do the job you want before you have it. And how you get there is by earning everyone's trust and earning kind of the right to fill in. So like if I'm an SDR and I've been at a company for a year and my AE's kid got sick and he has to like ask me if we should move the call. No, we should, we should not move the call. We should never move the call. Let me step in. Cause you know, this is my time, but on, got it. you know, what's really happening, David, is people are saying, I've never done it, but it's my time. Cause look at the, look at the calendar. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, you know, there's, and I'm just making a broad generalization, but there's there's kind of a feeling like, hey, I've been in this job for a year, and so now it's time to promote me. And I, I think that starts at the recruiting level because, you know, we were talking about earlier, like the recruiters will will say, like, hey, come in and do this SDR job for a year, and then you you know you could get promoted or you will get promoted and stuff like that. So they're just like, yeah, okay, I want to get promoted now, but it's like, well. Some people that like, you know, the job and they want to stay in it or, and so that, but they feel like I have to continue to move up because, you know, there's this SDR stigma of being an SDR, you know what I mean? Right, for sure. And what's interesting about that is 
so when I when I when I speak to anybody who's who's in this position, I always like to figure out like like where they see themselves in you know life and in like the next couple of years, and I think it's fun and like really fascinating as an exercise to see that because you know I know SDRs didn't want to go into solutions engineering, right? They want to do the technical side of the sales, so like a sales like a sales engineer, right? They want to do the heavy lifting of a technical sale. I know others who want to go into marketing. I know. Others who want to go into the field or go into, you know, the management side of things. Like there's no one size fits all track. And you do, you see these recruiters. And I think that's where you get, you know, I'm going to try and take credit for it, but it's the, it's the accidental bait and switch of startups where you see the recruiter. I saw one today. It literally said, you know, direct path to account executive role in 12 months or sooner comma, if you crush it. And that last, like that, that last sentence of if you crush it just seems like such a pipe dream because someone's going to come and get that job and they're going to crush it. And then they're going to hopefully print that recruiter's words out and say, Hey, I crushed it. Now what? And the company is going to go, Oh yeah, we don't, we're not ready for you. So we're, we like what you're doing. Just keep doing it. Yeah. Or and we, then do, we, we don't have an open position. I'm sorry. You right, know, and, and that, that's then the SDR is like, this place sucks. Yeah, that's where the resentment gets kind of planted as a seed in their brain, and and once the resentment's there, it's it's almost impossible to overcome because you feel like you were deceived, and so that's where like anybody who's joining in a, a startup or or a small company that's has recruiters and they're maybe they're promoting aggressive tracks, you have to understand that. The recruiters in sales too, right? So like they're just doing a job. Everyone's just doing a job. But that doesn't mean that you should be deceived. I think it's just you just have to have the patience and understand that like always be undeniable, always do the best you can. And for the most part, your company will do what's best to take care of you, whether it's financially or whether it's from a a promotion. Like if you're really crushing it, they don't want to lose you, but that doesn't mean like they have to give you something else. Yeah, exactly. It's funny. You just reminded me like when I talk to people who run outsourced, you know, SDR companies, they're, they just, they just laugh at this whole thing. They're just like, dude, we, we, we don't have any, any promotion path. Like when people come in, we're like, Hey dude, you're going to be an SDR forever. Like that's basically what we do at this job. And it's kind of refreshing in a way that there's no expectation. There's no entitlement, you know, and it's just kind of like, this is what I'm going to be doing. But they also have trouble on the flip side in that there's massive turnover, <laughs> you know? Sure. Cause, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that, that again, is it, you know, it's a whole different scenario, right? The outsourced, but it's not necessarily a bad idea. It's this premise that this is your job. It is, it is your job. You know, I think there's a, I think there's a movie where it's talking about, I'm drawing a blank. There's a movie about the military where they they say, this is your rifle is, it is like everybody else's rifle, but this one is yours, right? It's like, I think it's full metal jacket. It's kind of how I see this, right? Like this is your job. There are jobs like it, but this one is yours. So if you have that mindset, yeah, maybe you get promoted, but maybe you don't, but this is your job and you have a job. And so that's really interesting because, you know, I've, I've talked with people after like events or at conferences and they're like, you're so, seems like you're anti-promotion. I'm I'm not anti-promotion. I, I think everyone deserves to get what they want in life or what they earn through their, you know, their efforts. But it's just this understanding that if it's not coming, you might want to just sit, sit tight because bouncing around doesn't necessarily make it easier for it to come sooner. I think it's, I think it actually provides like a delayed, a delayed scenario. Are you in sales, but you're not using a sales engagement tool? Then you're probably losing out on revenue because you are not engaging with prospects at the right time with the right cadence, and with enough persistency. You need VanillaSoft. Start your free trial today. Go to VanillaSoft.com. Yeah, I mean, you you know, just like the reason that they hired you was to do the SDR job. I mean, I'm almost thinking like it would would be more honest just to – advertise it like look you're going to be an SDR. I mean that's that's what that's what we need and we need you to crush it and it's just like 
the whole career path thing is is kind of distracting. I mean, I, I, I get that it's motivational for SDRs to want to move up through the organization and it keeps everybody motivated that they're moving to the next step. But I think we just lost somewhere along the way that actually the SDR job is really, really important and it's very valuable. And, you know, I read a blog post by Tito saying that he pays like $200,000 to his SDRs because of what they're doing is so valuable. It's like, why would you want to set up a, uh, like revolving door in that department if what they're doing is so valuable. Exactly. And I, you know, I spoke with Tito last week. He's probably one of my favorite speakers at, at any of these sales conferences and he doesn't pay me to say that kind of stuff. So uh, this is a free, this is a free, this part of the podcast was brought to you by Tito. <laughs> exactly. So kind of going back to that, right. It, it the, the promotion is usually a stem from financial reasons, right? Most people in sales, and there's nothing wrong with this statement, are coin operated. That's why they're in sales. They want to make money and that's okay. It's okay to want to make money. It's okay to want to be wealthy or, or whatever your dreams are. But putting it, it, it's more than just like putting in the time. I like to think about it from like a baseball standpoint, right? Like there are people in the minor leagues who could probably play in the pros and get more money and they don't make really any, any money as a minor league player, right? They're just kind of making ends meet. They're not making a profit to be a minor league baseball player. It doesn't even matter who you are. You know, if you were, you know, Mike Trout or Bryce Harper or any, any minor league player who then moved up and got this mega contract, right? Like you were basically playing baseball just because you loved the game. And I think sales development needs to be something where you need to just do it because you love sales or you want to find out if you love sales and to that point, right, you said, like, you don't want it to be a revolving door. That's where it all comes together, where it's, you know, you don't want to have to have that tough conversation where you say, I'd love to promote you, but the amount of pipeline you would be leaving, like the hole you'd be leaving is not something that I can sustain right now through ramping someone else. Yeah. It's almost like being too good. Yeah, I know. I mean, and and that and so the weird thing that's happening is that so that person, let, we'll go with that scenario. Like they're like, "Hey, I was hired. I've been doing this for a year. I'm totally crushing it. You guys said that you were going to promote me. Let's go." You know, and and so as the there's there's a lot of different factors. One is as the manager, you're like, "Oh my god, you know, okay, the great. They're going to be promoted, but then there goes all the appointments and pipeline that we were having." And then on the from a business perspective, you know, the Bridge Group came out with a study uh, like last year saying that that the failure rate of people that go from SDR to AE is very high because it's a completely different job. They're not necessarily ready to do that. And so that that's a risk right there. And then if the if the SDR in that scenario gets the bad news that they're not going to be promoted because there's no job there or they're just concerned, then they start taking calls from recruiters. And they're like, hey, I want to go to a different company where I can become an AE and make some money. So the, just the whole thing is, it's just it's just a broken situation, I, I would say. Yeah. And I think you're totally right on that, especially, you know, the whole concept of, I don't, I didn't get what I want. So I'm going to leave because I don't understand how that can help you leapfrog, right? You have to learn and you have to, one, you have to get a new job. So there's an interview process there. You have to get acclimated to a product, to a culture, to a team. I'm not sure how leaving actually could be beneficial if you're doing a good job, right? It just seems like a way to start over. And starting up and starting over to get your way just seems like there's some issues you should look inside and, and kind of work through, right? It might be like a, like a personal, like a self-esteem issue. It might not be like a, it might be out of your company's control, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just looking back, like sometimes if, if you're in a good company with a good culture and, you know, you see, you see like a future for the company and but the promotion path is not there immediately of when you need it you may want to take the long view and i'm just speaking from experience like it's hard to find 
a really good company that has a big future and cool people and a good culture. And maybe you're not like super stoked about being an SDR, but I don't know. I mean, it might, it might be a good idea to put your head down and just do it for a couple of years because you never know at some point a position could open up that you're more interested in that you could fulfill versus just like dropping it and going, F this, I'm going to go to a different company. And then it ends up that company sucks. Sure. And if you look at, if we use, we can use me as a, as an example, I'll be a poster child for you. What I think the bridge group, so I think the study says like what, maybe nine months is when SDRs get the itch to just bounce. Yep. Okay. So Redlock was acquired and I was in month 17 of being an SDR and we got acquired for 200 million. I think it was, I think it was 173 if we're, if we're being 100% specific. So like almost 2x what Trish and the bridge group say, like I should have had this like itch to leave. But look what happened, right? Like we got acquired by a great company. There's definitely way more opportunity now that we got acquired. So it's just one of those weird things where you you have to weigh out the the risk strategy. You have to figure out how adverse you can be to risk. Like if you if you're not happy and you don't really care and you want to just take a, a leap of faith on another company, I mean I'm not here I'm not I don't think either of us are telling you to stop, but I just can't figure out in my mind how that would be a positive way forward. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's just, it's one of those things like <laughs> the story where the guy, you're heading toward a bridge and th- somebody comes running back that's all beat up and bruised and what, you know, their, their face yeah. is all bruised and, and th- they're going, um, the bridge is out. You know, it's like, y- you, you may want to just pause, like <laughs> t- t- tap the brakes a little bit and be like, wait a minute. Okay. Good company, good culture cool people. I like working here. I'm not exactly in the exact position that I want to be. You may want to just tap the brakes a little bit because you never know. But hey, looks like you made the right choice, man. So. Yeah. And, and all those things are interchangeable, right? That person yeah. can head towards the bridge and get in, get the, get the job they want, but then something else might fall off. So like the, the company might not be so great. But hey, you're you got you got your account executive role that you were chasing, or the culture is not good, or you don't like your coworkers. Like eventually, you do have to make a sacrifice in one of those buckets. I think yeah. I would rather have you know good people, you know nice people to work with, and a good culture at a company that I is going to thrive than just be selfish and be like, well, I want my title. This is the title I want. Yeah. You know, and and Completely I want to. I want to go back to one thing you said about the failure rate. You know, I I was reading a book by uh, Mike Weinberg, New Sales Simplified. I'm sure you've heard of it. And he actually he actually solved the failure problem for everybody in his book. He says, so Trish should read it and we should all get together and figure out how to apply it. But he talks about how we have an abundance of sales leaders, but not sales managers. And so the context behind that phrase is that the role has changed. So even if you watch the office, Michael Scott was going on customer visits where they were selling paper, like something as simple as a customer visit to sell paper. But the manager was there as a, as a guide to make sure, you know, the rep didn't make any sort of grave mistakes and get shamed. Right. Right. Yes. And so Mike's entire premise on that chapter is about how we have too many sales leaders and not enough sales managers. And the sales managers we do have are too concerned with the CRM, like the data, the activity, the metrics, and not with the mentorship and taking people under their wing and, and, and getting that like windshield time, like going to visit accounts with them and making sure that for at least the six months – that they're in this new role, they're not on an island. And I think that's part of why SDRs are failing is because they crush it as SDRs, opening the door, but they don't get a safe space to learn these closing skills. And then as the report shows, they fail. And then what do they do? They go back to being an SDR or do they just get out of sales completely? You know, it's one or the other. Some people might not recover or they just lie about how their account executive time went to get another job. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, I, I love that. B- big plug for Mike Weinberg's book. I, everybody should read that. That's a really, really, it brings it totally down to basics. And I, I think it goes on both ways. I mean, like a lot of times somebody was asking on LinkedIn, like, what's the first thing that you should do as a, a new SDR manager? And my response was like, dude, keep doing the SDR job. Like for, you know, an hour a day, at least like, like go in and, and work your process. And so then you're able to actually help people with what they're doing versus just being like a, I think he calls it like a dashboard jockey, you know, just like to making sure that people are making 500 phone calls every day. And it's the same on the sales rep side. I mean, if, if the, the, the art of like that coaching is, is has kind of dissipated with all the technology it seems and you know you you're you don't have that windshield time that we used to so yeah i think that i think that's is such a great way to put put it all in a context i think that more you know uh, sdr managers should have maybe a, a you know a short list of accounts that they chip in on i think you know, I think it was uh, Morgan Ingram who, when he was at Terminus, I think he had said like there was a team quota, and if it was the last week of the month and the the team wasn't where they needed to be, like he had to like put on the suit. <laughs> and I think, and I think that's maybe never take it off, right? Maybe you're like a player coach, and you know you're doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but your overall goal is to just make sure that all of the players on your team not only are crushing it, but they're happy and you're helping them with kind of the battlefield part of the job. Totally. I mean, if you think about it, like, Hey, here's a script. Like I just wrote this script. They use this on your cold calls and they, they go back to their desk and they start using it. And then they're like, dude, this script sucks, man. This, This script doesn't work. And they're telling all their coworkers, but just think about it. If you were sitting there right next to them using it and then you're like, you know what? The script sucks. <laughs> you throw it away. You know, there's a little bonding there. There's like leading by example and, you know, it's... I think, yeah, totally. I think, and so that is a bittersweet moment to think about. I put together like this cam- this outreach campaign and, you know, I gave it to my colleague and he crushed me. <laughs> and it was like, I was like, I don't know what gives. Like, I, I literally wrote all of these emails. Like I, I did the work. I sent the same emails to the same personas. It was just a different geography. Uh, yep. But that's what's bittersweet. It's bitter because I'm like, okay, well, why isn't it working for me? But it's sweet because it's like, okay, at least it's, at least it's repeatable and it's working for someone else. And that's where you have to like lose the selfishness and go, well, he's, it's working for him. Eventually – I'm sure the tables will turn and I'll have the month where it works and he, he will go away with, Hey, it's broken. It used to work and he'll tap on the screen, but it's all about that process. And I think this all comes full circle to what you're saying, which is what if an SDR might not believe or feel confident in what is being pushed down on them as messaging and how do they ultimately gain the respect and trust to try different things? Yep. Exactly. Well, Christopher, this has been awesome, man. I, I really appreciate it. I, I, I think that we could keep going, but we'll get you on another sales development podcast and keep digging in on these topics. If people want to get in touch with you, if they want to connect with you, what's the best way to go about that? The best way to connect with me is uh, on LinkedIn. So if you just go to the search bar, you can just type in uh, Christopher Fago. That's F-A-G-O. I'm sure David will link it in the comments. We will definitely. Well, best of luck with everything. Thank you so much for being on the show and we'll, we'll get you on again soon. Thanks, David. Thank you for listening to the sales development podcast, the only audio forum, 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.